Looking in 1 Timothy chapter 6 this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 6, we've been going through the book of Timothy, and we're just, just about to the end. Uh, the, the theme verse is 1 Timothy 3.15, or the, the key verse, uh, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. <laughs> it's written to a church, written to a pastor, and we need to, to know how God wants us to behave ourselves together as a church. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, the subject is godliness and contentment. This is, uh, I think, contentment is what most people want, I, I would think. Uh, but they don't understand that you don't get contentment without godliness. If you're not content this morning, it's because you're not godly. Uh, we're going to read 1 Timothy chapter 6, and let me start in verse 1, I'll read down through verse 10. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they're brethren, but rather do them service because they're faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strife of, of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We just stop reading there. It's a great portion of Scripture because it's so practical to life, isn't it? Uh, he deals with... Uh, your work life, that's a big part of our life. He deals with money. We hope that's a part of our life at some point. Uh, and submission to God's word. You know, as Christians, that's, that's crucial. Godliness and contentment, it applies to every area of life. And the mistake we make sometimes is thinking, you know, the world likes to divide things into secular and sacred. Yeah, you know, what we do in real life and then what we do in spiritual life. But that's, that's not the way it is in reality. Everything is sacred. Godliness and contentment applies to every area of life. And, and like I said, if we don't have contentment, it's because we don't have godliness. You know, the world is trying to get what God offers without God. And that's just not the way it works. Uh, you know, God, godliness comes from everything we do. Uh, our testimony comes from everything we do. Uh, do you realize... If you're a Christian and people are aware that you're a Christian, they don't just watch you at church. In fact, they probably, probably don't watch you at church. <laughs> they might look to see that you go to church, but they watch you at home. They watch how you treat your dog. <laughs> you know, they watch how you treat your children, what you do with your lawn, you know, how, uh, what you do it, it, that they see. That's, to them, that's what's going to show them whether you're godly or not. And by the way, God watches us all the time. He doesn't just watch us at church. <laughs> we were talking, Doyle was teaching the lesson this morning uh, in, in our Sunday school class. And, you know, the, the Holy Spirit, God, knows everything we do. When we stand up, when we sit down, what we think, you know, all of those things. Uh, people watch us. God watches. And, and by the way, kids, your parents watch you. you know, I've, had, I've, I've had parents of, of our Sunday school kids say, well, they're going to Sunday school, but it hasn't, hasn't made them any better. <laughs> Your parents are watching you to see, are they godly? Are they following the Lord? I was a young man when I realized that I had a testimony to my parents. You know, that's kind of a scary thing, but it's true. And parents, your kids are watching you. Probably they're going to follow in your steps. We need to be careful. The Bible says it's all sacred. In 1 Corinthians, he says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Every area of our life. Uh, Matthew, 
5, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, people look at us as Christians and have an estimate of our, our God. How you keep your house, how you drive your car, what you do with the Bible. You know, we think of that as spiritual, but our whole life has to do with godliness. It all reflects on our God. Did you notice at the end of verse 1 there, He's talking about, the context is your work, but he says that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. God says you need to be a good worker because you're a Christian. Um, blaspheme means spoken evil of. You know, it, it's, it's important for us as Christians that we remember we have a testimony, both before our God and before the world as we, we live our lives. And the first area he deals with, he, he deals with three basic things in this, this portion. Uh, submission to our, in, in our work, uh, submission to God's word, and our attitude toward money. Those are three very important parts of, of godliness. Contentment and your boss. Now, some of you are self-employed. Uh, it, it's hard to please your boss, but uh, <laughs> you still have authorities that are over you. And you need to have contentment in your, in your relationship to authorities. And he deals with two areas of authority. People who are not saved, that are your boss, and people who are saved, other Christians. First, the first verse there, he talks about when you have a, a, he uses the word master, a servant-master relationship. He says, when that person is not a Christian, you honor them. Count their own masters worthy of all honor. And he says that the Name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Uh, God wants us to treat those over us with respect. And you know, sometimes you won't necessarily like the person that's over you, but you still honor their position. You know, when a policeman comes up to you and you've broken the law, it doesn't matter what his personality is like. <laughs> you respect his, his position and that uh, you just, just deal with them the way you would want to be dealt with when you're having a bad day. Uh, and you know, the Bible tells us specifically, it's not just the good bosses. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, he, he, he's very clear on this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. He says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. That word froward means crooked. You know, they're a bit bent. They're not, they're not right. Uh, he says, you, you honor them. He says, this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. So we do it for the Lord. And the Bible says in verse 20 that we do this as Jesus set the example. Jesus wasn't always treated right, was he? Uh, but he was always respectful. Uh, the Bible gives us an insight in, second, in 1 Peter 2, verse 11, when he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Uh, we're, we're pilgrims. You know, we're, we're not of this world. We're in the world, but we're not of it. We're trying to reach the world for Christ. Uh, so he says when, uh, when you have a boss that's not saved or a boss that's not good, you still honor them, uh, their position. Then in verse 2, he talks about Christian bosses. This is, it's interesting, the word he uses here is, let them not despise them. You think, well, why would we do that? But you know what we do sometimes? When we, when we know somebody else is like we are, we don't treat them with the respect that they're due sometimes. You, you think about it. If, if somebody is a Christian and you're doing business with them, sometimes we think, well, they should give me a good deal. But you know what we should be thinking? I should give them a good deal. This is my Christian brother. His business is at stake here. Boy, I should pay him extra. Don't despise them. Now, he's talking about bosses. So when your boss is a Christian, don't just think, well, he should let me off. You know, he knows I've got to go to prayer meeting. And, uh, you know, he knows I've... Listen, don't despise them. Treat them with respect. Now, they've got to... Uh, they probably have a boss, too. And, uh, they have to make money. money. Uh, don't devalue them is what he's saying. Let me give you a couple of passages. The, the Bible says a lot about our work. Uh, Titus chapter 2, uh, verse 9 and 10, just a couple pages to the right there from 1 Timothy, Titus chapter 2, verse 9, 
don't want to take too much time on this, but uh, it, it is important. It's part of godliness is how we work. Titus 2.9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. Yeah, listen to this, not answering again, not purloining. That means not stealing, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. That's a wonderful phrase. We're supposed to adorn the doctrine of God. What are you doing when you put on an adornment? You're trying to look better. We want, the, we want our testimony to make the Lord look better. You know, a boss should be glad that he has a Christian worker. Amen. I can count on him. He'll be on time. And she'll, you know, she, she does a thorough job. Uh, we should be uh, people who adorn the doctrine of Christ. Not talking back, not stealing. You know, when, when they're paying you for 10 hours, you should work 10 hours. Not seven and a half. Um, adorning the, the doctrine of God. Uh, another passage is Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. And, and these are not all of them. There's, there's a lot more, but these were some real key ones. There's a real th a key thought I want you to get here. Colossians 3, verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers. You ever done that where you just keep, look like you're busy so the boss won't get on you? <laughs> not, as, I, not, as, not with eye service. But in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. And here's the key. For you serve the Lord Christ. See, this is what we're talking about. Godliness. Everything we do is done for the Lord. In our work, in our play, in our worship, it's done for the Lord. Uh, God doesn't call us to serve self. You know, that's the world's goal. What can the world do for me? God calls us, he says, you serve the Lord Christ. And godliness means that you'll be content to work. Now, there's some things you should not be content with. Let me give you one. You should not be content to do less than your best. God doesn't want you to be content with less than your best. Secondly, God doesn't want you to content with ignoring or disobeying God's word. I find a lot of people are content with ignoring or disobeying God's word. They think, well, eh, good enough. My wife hates it when I say good enough. <laughs> she hears me doing a job and I say, oh, that's good enough. She likes it when I say, perfect. <laughs> so I try to save that whether it is or not. <laughs> uh, contentment with God's word. Content with, with, with uh, obeying the Lord. Uh, that's what we need. We need to be content to obey the Lord. And that's what he talks about in, in 1 Timothy uh, 6, verses 3 through 5 there. At the end of verse 2, he says, These things teach and exhort. These things teach and exhort. Uh, God wants us to obey his word. This whole book is God's word. Now, there's parts that will make more sense to you. There's parts that are more uh, practical and, and so on. Uh, but the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Right. All Scripture. And it's profitable. Uh, in, in fact, in, just after that verse, that's 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Timothy 4.2, he says, Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. God's Word. Uh, it's so important. And he uses that expression there in, in 1 Timothy, the end of uh, verse 2 of chapter 6, these things teach and exhort. The word teach means to explain. If you don't understand what's in the Bible, get somebody to teach you. Get somebody to explain it. And then he says exhort. That means urge to follow. Now, as you read God's word, uh, we sing a little song. It's called Three Questions. As I read God's word each day, I'll ask myself three questions. What does it say? What does it mean? What is God saying to me? Very simple. That's basically what he's saying here. You need to understand what it's saying. If you don't understand the words or something, find out what it means. And then what does it mean you should do? What, what is it, what's the application for it? Uh, these things teach and exhort. The word exhort means to come alongside. I always, I always put my arm out when I think of it. You, know, you come alongside somebody and you say, come on, let's, let's do this together. Let's follow the Lord together. That's what a church is all about. It's encouragement. Now we get to the negative part. Sorry, we had to get there. Verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as I read that this week, I thought, wow, 
Yet we are so dumb if we don't listen to the Lord. Yeah, many of you here are parents or have some form of authority over people. Isn't it annoying? Isn't it hard when you tell somebody to do something, they ignore you? Doyle told a grandchild something yesterday. <laughs> Didn't want to do it. Uh, you know? uh, but we're hearing from the Lord. You know, what he's talking about here is um, we need to obey the Lord. These are the words of the Lord. This is not my opinion or, you, you know, an idea that we thought, oh, let's try this. God says, this is the truth. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Amen. When God speaks, man, we need to, we need to listen. Uh, Isaiah put it this way. He said, oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. See, the problem we have is we keep thinking we can go our own way. God says, no, you need to go his way. You need to go God's way. And the result for him was the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The sins Jesus died for were us going our own way. Christ died for our, for our sins. And the Bible says uh, that these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, when we don't follow the words of the Lord, one of the things that's true of us is we're rebellious. We consent not to wholesome words, even to the Lord, words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible says rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. He's saying it's really bad. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, totally against God. We don't want to be rebellious people. Uh, again, Isaiah, I can find it here, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. Just listen to it. should have written it down. He says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. He's saying if, if they're not going by this word, it's because there's no light in them. We don't want to be, I hope you don't want to be a rebellious person, a person rebelling against the Lord. We need the light of the Lord. We need him to show us uh, the way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And that's what we need. He says if we don't listen, if we teach otherwise, we're rebellious. Secondly, he says, verse 4, he is proud. Now, I would challenge you, you look through the Bible and just see if there's anywhere in the Bible where God recommends being proud. I don't think he does. You know, we think of pride as a good thing. God says, man, pride comes before a fall. Uh, it, it's a problem. In, in fact, in James chapter 4, verse 6, he says, God resisteth the proud. Now, I, I don't know what you want in life, but I don't want God's resistance. <laughs> you can't stand up against the Lord. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and, and verse 31 gives you an indication of this when he says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Listen, it, it's not just a little thing. It's a fearful thing to have God resist you, to have God against you. Uh, if we teach otherwise than God's word, and, and you know, this is written to Christians. And we expect the world to ignore God's word. But as Christians, we need to be careful that we don't uh, teach otherwise. It's not about your opinion or my opinion. Really, it makes no difference what we think. <laughs> Other than we're going to give an account to the Lord. Uh, it's what God says. If we teach otherwise, he says uh, we're rebellious. He's proud. And then he says, knowing nothing. Now, I've found over the years that people don't like it if you say that they're ignorant. I learned that in a very practical way. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking of the word as just a word. It, means, it just means you don't know something. I was talking to a lady about the Bible, and she obviously didn't know anything about the Bible. And, and I happened to use the word ignorant. Oh, man, she went up and turned left. Uh, she didn't like that. But, you know, it's, it, it's true. If we're not going to follow God's word, if we don't know God's word, we're just, there's a lot of things I'm ignorant of. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many, I don't even know all the things I'm ignorant of. But you know, when it comes to God's word, uh, we don't want to be rebellious or proud or ignorant. Um, the Bible, we looked at that one phrase already about coming to the light in Ephesians 4 and, and verse 18. He says that there's people who have the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart. You know, a lot of people are ignorant of the Lord. They don't know Him. They don't know about the, the things of God. They don't know about creation and about a redemption and, and you know, Jesus coming again and so on. And God's call to them is come to the light. You know, 
Only God can heal our blindness, spiritually and, and physically. And, and the choice is your way or God's way, darkness or light. And, and you know, it, it can be kind of offensive to have someone say that we're ignorant, but God says that we're, we're often ignorant of the, of the things of the Lord. And as Christians, we need to allow God to be teaching us. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, listen, you need to come to, to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one that, that you need to know. So if we teach, if we don't follow God's word, we're, we're rebellious, we're proud, we're ignorant. And then really he says in verse 4, but doting about questions and strifes of words. Uh, I would use the word here, we're, we become irrelevant. <laughs> if you're not going to follow God's word, your life just becomes irrelevant to, to others because you, you have no answers. Listen, anybody can have questions. And you know, some people have some really good questions. I meet people all the time who they want to hit me with their question, you know. They got their killer question. The, the thing about life is we all have questions. The one we want to honor is the one who has answers. And Jesus is the answer. Jesus has the answers for our life and for eternity. And the problem is, you see this kind of person. Now, put yourself in this. If there's areas where you're not willing to follow the Lord, here's what he says is the result. Whereof comes envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings. It just goes on, doesn't it? I don't think that's the way most people wake up in the morning and think, yeah, boy, I want a life today of envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings. You know, most of us want contentment, I would think. And the Bible says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, the, the psalmist wrote in, in Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Listen, not only do we not want to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, we don't want to be the ungodly. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You meet people like that, don't you? Oh, they're just scornful. They don't have any answers. They just have scorn. It doesn't help. Now, this morning, you need to know the Lord. You need to have the truth. Uh, you can have contentment in, from God's Word. You can have contentment in your work. Uh, we should be content to submit to authority because we serve the Lord. Uh, we should be content to submit to the Bible. And godliness with contentment is great gain. One more. We should not be content just to make money. You know, for some people, that's their whole goal in life. Uh, you can tell your values by where you spend your time and your money. It, it won't lie. And as Christians, we need to make sure that we're not living for the wrong thing. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, money will not bring you contentment. Uh, we can prove that. Uh, Proverbs 15, it's an interesting verse. He says, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Now, stalled ox may not mean much to you today, but it's, it's like having a BMW in the garage. All right? He's saying it's better to have a dinner of herbs, you know, just fruit and vegetables or whatever, with love, than have wealth and hatred. It's true. You look at our, our world today. Now, the people who are rich, they're not content. They're, there's never enough. You ask them, how much do you want? Just a little more. There's never enough when, when you're living for money. Money will not bring contentment. And money is not lasting. Did you notice verse 7? We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Classic example, you know, when the rich man dies, they say, how much did he leave? He left it all. We don't take anything with us. Now, there is a possible exception to that. We can take people with us. People get saved, we'll see them in heaven. But uh, listen, you're not going to take your house. You wouldn't want it in heaven. <laughs> you certainly don't want your car there. Uh, money is not lasting. And then verse 8, really, our basic needs are pretty easily met. Now, you, you may not understand where this is coming from, but uh, he says, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. You know, the, the real basics of life are, are really pretty simple. It's not some, our problem is not so much what we have, it's what we want. Yeah, it's when you have a countertop and you think, oh, I want a granite countertop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got three bedrooms, I want four bedrooms. 
You know, I was an adult before we lived in a house with two bathrooms. I didn't know anybody had two bathrooms. I thought you had to bang on the door to get into the bathroom, you know? <laughs> uh, contentment. Uh, the things we really need are not a whole lot. He talks about food and raiment, maybe a place to stay. Um, our basic needs are pretty easily met. Some of you met the Pollocks that were here two weeks ago. Uh, he went from here then to Vanuatu and preached for our missionary uh, there in uh, Vanuatu. And uh, his comment was, things are very simple there. <laughs> I don't think he used the word primitive, but, uh, uh, you know, there's just not a whole lot going on. And people are pretty, pretty easy with it. You know, when you got enough food and you got a place to stay, and uh, it doesn't really take a whole lot unless we're looking for something we don't have. Uh, Paul wrote in, in Philippians chapter 3, he talks a lot about contentment. In Philippians 3 and, and verse 7, he says, What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. He came to a point in his life where he realized that the things he'd been living for really weren't worth anything. He says, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of, of Christ. And then later on in Philippians 4.11, he says, he says, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Then he lays it out. I know both how to be abased, you know, to be humbled, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And if we'll be thankful for what God gives us, we won't worry so much about what we don't have. Uh, we don't want to live for money. Uh, our basic needs, God promises to supply. And he warns us here in 1 Timothy that the desire for wealth leads to sin. Verse 9, they that will be rich. He's talking about people who that's their goal. That's what I want. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. That word destruction means ruin or death. Perdition means waste or, or to perish. You know, Jesus asked the question, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Somewhere in our world is the richest person. Somebody. Probably changes day by day. But what will it gain them if they don't give their heart to the Lord? If they die and go to hell? Uh, we came in with nothing, we'll go out with nothing. Let me ask you this morning, what are you living for? Where do you spend your time and your money? Uh, is it wealth? Is it Pride, is it ease? Uh, you could name a hundred things. But you know, more important is, where will you spend eternity? Will it be heaven? Will it be hell? Do you know? If you're on your way to heaven, what will you take with you? See, godliness with contentment is great gain. And I would just encourage you this morning to think about this. I imagine you want contentment. Godliness is the key. Trust the Lord. Don't teach otherwise. Don't think you can ignore or disobey God's word and have godliness and contentment. It just doesn't work that way. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, someone asked the question, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? It's a sobering question. But you know, that has more to do with what the world thinks. More important would be, if God were to ask, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? You see, it makes a difference what God thinks. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. We're going to stand before God and give an account. It's a, it's a simple thing to be saved because God has done all the work. A, he says, to admit that you're a sinner. All of sin, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. B is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that means to believe that he's the son of God, that he is who he said he is, that he died for you, that he rose again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And C, the Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is he your Lord? Godliness starts with God. You have to come to him, and he'll receive you. He said, Any, anybody that comes to him, he'll not, he'll not turn them away. Uh, do you have godliness with contentment? Do you want godliness with contentment? God offers it today. We're going to 
sing the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I, I think that's the, the answer to what we're